You usually don't have clients coming in with hundreds of thousands, half a million dollars of unsecured debt, or you may have that in businesses or lines of credit for business assets. That's one thing. But this is typically, for the most part, the largest debt you're going to have, which has also, ironically, to do with one of the largest assets most households will own. Hey everyone, and welcome to Make Your Money Matter. I'm your host, Brad Barrett, and I'm also a managing director and partner here at One Capital Management. And I'm here each and every week to help you make more confident money moves because after all, your money matters. And today, friends, we're gonna be talking about your house. It's an interesting topic around a home, specifically the house that we choose to live in or the one that we might be looking to own. It's a very interesting topic for everyone as it relates to each of us in different ways. To some, it's a roof over our head. To others, it's an investment. And many of you listening or watching here are probably a lot like me. When you buy a house, you get a mortgage. And when you get a mortgage, what's your first thought? I want to pay off that mortgage. I know I heard that from my parents. My parents heard that from their parents and so on. So I want to go through the history and the philosophy and the psychology around mortgages as it relates to our money and then get into three specific questions that I think are really important when it comes to the topic, the, the general larger topic of real estate. How much house can I afford? How much of my monthly income should go to my house? And should I really care about interest rates? But before we answer those questions and talk about our house, let's smash that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. All right, let's get into it. So before we start talking about this subject matter, let's talk about a few stats. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, 42% of households in the United States have mortgages. That's over 51 and a half million total American households. And the average mortgage debt in our country is $202,454. Now, I share those stats to talk about this. When you get a mortgage, you are essentially taking on debt. And in my experience in nearly 20 years, this is typically the most debt that many of us as Americans will take on in our life, their mortgage. Now, you've heard me mentioned the word before when it comes to investments and debt of tolerance level. And I've mentioned this on previous episodes about debt. Uh, some people don't mind carrying debt. I have a lot of clients who sleep plenty fine at night with $30,000, $40,000 in debt. And I have some clients who literally lose sleep over carrying $1,000 of credit card debt and anywhere in between. So I bring this up to remind ourselves we need to filter and, and put into context what it is that you feel and how your emotions are around debt and specifically around home purchases. Now, today's subject and today's show is not so much about debt, but rather the other side of that, the asset. Because debt can be a good thing if you use it right. But it also needs to be managed within your portfolio, your overall household portfolio, uh, to make sure that it's done in the right and efficient way. So a little history I think is important in context when it comes to mortgages. Prior to the 1920s, any kind of debt or, or what we now call a mortgage or any leverage was actually done within the family. In fact, it's today while we still have what's called an AFR rate, the Affiliated Family Rate. You can look that up. Now, it wasn't until the end of World War I and into the 1920s where all of a sudden we had banks becoming the intermediary, the lender. Now, in those days, mortgages were actually callable, which means that, that at any point, if you owed money on your home, the bank could basically come in and say, hey, you're out. This, this loan is due in 30 days and we'll have to displace you from your home. Now, further to that point, mortgages at that time period when they were first getting started by banks, they weren't 30 years long. They were five years long. They weren't these long mortgages. So as always, it's something I know I bring from my own background into this. And I talk about the psychology and the philosophy around some of the items I mentioned. The first notion I talked about about paying your house off when you first get a mortgage stems from two generations ago. You know, from the 1920s to now, we're around 100 years or so, which is really only roughly two or three generations. So anyone listening or watching right now is probably in one of those two or three generations. If you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s and have been told this by your parents maybe, you might've been born in the 50s or 60s or 70s or but vice versa. You were born in the 50s, 60s or 70s and you heard this in information from uh, your grandparents who were born in the early 1900s. You can see how we created a culture of people that 
believe the only way we could truly have security was by having our mortgage paid off. Now, obviously over the years and over the decades, a lot has changed and a lot has happened with regards to the laws surrounding mortgages because they're no longer callable anymore and you can't be displaced from your mortgage necessarily. We have laws in place for that. We've also been conditioned to believe for many, many years that we need or have to have security as soon as we pick up that debt on a house. And the only way to do that is to pay the house off. Now, for the next little while, I'm gonna challenge some of these and how those may not be the best way to think about it. Now, again, context is important. I'm not saying it's the wrong idea to have your house paid off, but it's interesting to look at how the laws have changed and what it means to you. And on a mortgage on a house today may or may not be of interest to you, depending on, again, your certain situation, which leads us into the three questions that I talk with my clients a lot about that I think are important when it comes to a mortgage and your home. Now, the first question I bring up is how much can I afford? Because usually when we start this conversation, that's typically our starting point. And for many of you watching or listening right now, no matter your age or your financial circumstance, you've likely gone through this question in one way or another. Now, my second question I bring up is how much of my monthly income should be going towards my house? I bring those two up right out of the gate because they actually go hand in hand. Now you might be thinking, okay, so where do we start with this conversation? Uh, for us here at One Capital Management, it starts with our discovery to take a look at what incomes are, what your current debts are, are you married, do you have kids, like what your outflow is. We start with those kind of questions. But what I wanna share today on the show, on Make Your Money Matter today, is around some rules of thumb that I think are important for us to use as a base to start our conversation. The first one I wanna bring up is the 50-30-20 rule, uh, which basically states that 50% of your income should go towards what I call living expenses. That's including your house. That's also insurances, uh, food, not dining out, but food and items like that. The important stuff, the stuff that you need to do every day, every week, every month. The 30% would be towards what I call lifestyle expenses. This is the dining out. This is the travel. This is the ancillary stuff on top of the stuff that you need to do every month, no matter what. Then the last 20% is for savings or investments, or essentially retirement or debt repayment. So if you start there from right there, I think it's important to understand that 50, 30, 20 is a good rule of thumb to kind of look at for those of you looking to budget, just to start there, right? And then I wanna move into what's gonna dovetail into our second question, which is how much of our monthly income should go towards a house, which will then help us answer how much house we can afford. When it comes to the question around how much of my income as a percentage should go towards something as specific as a house. Going back to the first rule I just mentioned, the 50, 30, 20, it would likely fall in the 50%. Now, remember, that's not the only thing in that category, right? There's also your insurances, your gas, your utilities, uh, food, actual food, you know, everything from taking care of yourself. We call those activities of daily living in your living expenses. So we need to break it down into more of a, uh, as a certified financial planner myself, the board comes out and talks about these rules of thumb. And I wanna bring this one up to you. Somewhere between 28 to 35% of your monthly income should go towards what's called PITI. This is relatively specifically to your house. And PITI stands for principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. So if we start there, and if it comes between 28 to 35%, including all of those factors when it relates to your house, you're typically within the ballpark of answering the question, of how much of my money should go towards my overhead or basically paying debt down on a house that we own. By the way, you can use that same rule of thumb in terms of rent. And, and I think it's important to bring it up here real quickly. And I think it's wise, and I wanna share this as counsel of nearly 20 years of working with clients in all different kinds of financial situations. You don't need to own a home. I think the American dream has always been, you have to own a home, you know, uh, uh, you just, that's the way, that's, that's success in terms of having a house or a family. And I bring this up only to say this, I've seen a lot of plans built where rent becomes a factor. I mean, just take in consideration you're watching right now and you're a young person. Now, getting in and talking about the investment side is wise in the sense of buying a house and investing in that house. I agree with that, but it also limits you because it's not a liquid asset. You can't just trade it like a stock. So it becomes a little bit more tangible, a little bit more 
illiquid. So if you're still trying to find your career, you're moving jobs maybe, or or you find a love interest, you're trying to go and they're they're out of state or out of the you know the county that you're in, you know, you want to be a little more flexible. So give yourself some time to really work through your planning at certain stages and ages of your life versus just, okay, uh, I'm 25 years old, I got my first job, I think I'm in my career, and now the next thing I need to do is buy a house. Now, I'm not saying that's not the right move. I'm just saying it's okay to think through it, talk with your advisor. That's what we do here at One Capital to make sure we put it into context. And when I talk about the two rules of thumb I just brought up, there is something I wanna bring up when it comes to rules of thumb. They are just that, they're rules of thumb. They don't take into account your personal circumstances. And this decision, when it comes to actually making the decision that's right for you, involves some math, it involves emotions, it involves circumstances and trade-offs. And it's, it's all encompassing. And before we get into some qualifiers about how to think about these questions, that's what I wanted to bring up about the need to buy a house and whether that's the right fit for you. And that helps us get to, again, the question of how much of my monthly income should be going towards that. And we look at that and say, these are again, rules of thumb. So play it how you need to in terms of your comfort level on the house. And let's reinvert those back up to the original question of how much house can I afford? This is also gonna lead into my uh, third question today was, do I really need to care about interest rates? So first and foremost, when we talk about a mortgage, there's multiple kinds of mortgages, right? And I'm gonna talk about the two generic ones when it comes to fixed versus variable. Now you need to know something. When you fix a interest rate, meaning you have a stated interest rate for a 30 year fixed environment, that's a typical example. You can do 15, 20, 25, 30, there's different ways to do it. But when you fix it, the majority of the interest is uploaded in the front. So on a 30 year fix, typically in between the first eight to 12 years is largely interest. Now you'll start seeing after that 10 year mark, 11 year mark, 12 year mark, the amount of the payment, which is the same, the amount of interest and principal starts to switch. Mortgage companies do this because they wanna get their money back first, makes sense, fine. For those of you listening right now, when it comes to debt, because mortgage is a debt backed by an asset, this falls into my camp of what I'll call good debt. And there's three categories of good debt. It's lower interest, it's typically deductible, and it's for or collateralized by an asset. So when you talk about mortgages, they fit all of those categories, right? It's typically lower, and by lower I mean not double digits like unsecured debt would be like a credit card. So if you look at mortgages as an example, even though they are higher this year, they have definitely gone up. We've all seen it. In fact, as of the recording of this, we've just seen a 75 basis point uh, increase in the Fed in general for this year, 2022. So we're gonna likely see some higher rates coming up, but we need to put that into context because yes, it's higher than it was last year, but it's nowhere near what we were paying in the 80s. For many of you watching or listening right now, uh, we were paying double digit mortgage rates in the 80s. Now it was all relative because we were also getting paid nine or 10% in a CD at that time. But the point of the matter is it's still lower than what you would otherwise get as debt. And then you look at the appreciation rate. Historically speaking, real estate has done anywhere between four and 5% of an appreciation. Now, these past couple of years, we've obviously seen an acceleration of that, but over 30 year cycles, we've seen it right around a 5% appreciation. So even though we're paying debt right now, at about 5%, the appreciation you should see, based on historical data, on your house will be right around the same. So it is a good forced savings in a way uh, to put into it, and you're getting some deductions along the way. So if you have a 5% mortgage, depending on your income and other circumstances, which you talk with your CPA about, it's likely deductible through Schedule A deductions. So when you look at a, as an example, hypothetical, if you're gonna go get a 5% mortgage and you're in the 20% tax bracket, and you can write off that interest, you're basically net net paying about 4%, right? 20% off of five is 1%, 4%. So your net pay because of the deduction is actually lower than the APY or APR that you're paying. So it's interesting to look at those things as you discuss how much of my income should go towards paying a house and then ultimately back up into how much house can I afford? How much house can I afford is a, is a encompassing question and here's why. It involves all of the aspects of a mortgage. We've been talking for the first few minutes here about a mortgage, but when we reinvert the math equation back up to the actual price of the house, the first thing that comes up is down payment. Because as an example, let's say you're going to look at a million dollar house or a million dollar condo or townhome or whatever it is. And the typical rule of thumb, as many of us know, is you wanna to try to put 20% down. So on my hypothetical example, you're looking to buy a million dollar property, 
you want to try to put $200,000 down. We're going to talk about that in a second because I know that's a harder thing to do nowadays than it's been in the past. And we're going to talk through that. But at 20%, at $200,000, that means your mortgage is at 800. Now you'll notice the equations and the rules of thumb I just provided have a lot to do with the monthly note on the mortgage. Nothing to necessarily do, but also everything to do with the asset or the price of the house itself. So the amount of debt you carry on your home has a lot to do with how much you put down, does it not? So if you think about interest rates, which gets us into our third question of, do we really care about interest rates? We do. Why? Because it's a part of the math equation that fits into a mortgage. What I want to share is this. I don't think it needs to be as concerning as a lot of people make it out to be. When we see a Fed funds rate, or like we've been seeing like a lot this year of the rates increasing, I think a lot of us freak out a little bit and think, oh my gosh, my mortgage is going to double tomorrow and I can't afford my house. It, it doesn't work like that. Especially if you're in a fixed environment right now, it won't even affect you really. Variable, it does affect you. So now's a great time to take a look at some things around fixing the rate, as I call it. Yes, you're higher, but you know, it's important to look at it and bring some peace of mind into this equation. So yes, we do care about interest rates. That's a very easy blanketed statement when it comes to interest rates. But it does also get us to the larger question of, with all those things considered, uh, somewhere between 20 to 35% of our household income going to a mortgage, uh, being within the 50% of living expenses in my first rule of thumb, and then caring about interest rates, the only other thing that's a variable here is our down payment. So when we talk about saving for a down payment, which I do with a lot of our clients, um, it really has a lot to do with your discipline and the energy you want to put to it. And I share this openly because look, I don't care what you're reading or what you're hearing. There's no quick fix to go and save money to a down payment. There's no stork that's going to drop off $200,000 on your front door. I know we like to think that sometimes. So the reality is, if you're watching this right now or listening, putting a plan in place that does simple math of saying, if I put I'm making this up as a hypothetical. If I put $2,000 a month, I'll have $24,000 at the end of this year, which means I have $48,000 by the end of next year. And you can just go on and on and on until you get to the house price or the area you want to live. So let's start with the questions. How much house can I afford? Where do you want to live? Are you living in California or are you living in Wyoming? Different house prices, right? Uh, it also has to do with mortgage rates are federal for the most part. They're state domicile, but they have a difference depending on where you're at. Um, property taxes is a part of that P-I-T-I, -I. so taxes come into play. In California here, we have pretty high tax uh, property taxes as well as New York. Other areas don't. And so it's important to kind of take a look at what those mean to your P-I-T-I, -I, that notion of the principal interest taxes and insurance relative to this debt. But if you start building up your down payment, you can then start moving the needle. So if you save $50,000 right now, you can afford this amount. If you start saving 100,000, this can go out, right? The house price has a lot to do with how much you put down and how much of debt you're going to carry. So it's a sliding scale. And when you move things around, things change. I would just say always come back to those rules of thumb. Again, the rules of thumb, but they are really great bedrocks, if you will, to kind of base your planning on. And then sit with an advisor. Go through the planning as it relates to this as not only just your house or your home, but also as your investment. Again, as I stated in the onset of this show, this is the largest debt most clients will take on. You usually don't have clients coming in with hundreds of thousands, half a million dollars of unsecured debt, or you may have that in businesses or lines of credit for business assets. That's one thing. But this is typically, for the most part, the largest debt you're going to have, which has also, ironically, to do with one of the largest assets most households will own. When you have a million dollar house, but you have $700,000 of debt, your net equity is only 300, but you own technically, I mean, the bank owns it right now until you get to under 50%, but you own that asset as long as you make the payment. So it is a forced asset and it is something that you're basically front loading the asset up front and you're diligently paying it down as time goes by. So there's aspects to what the right mortgage is for you that an advisor can help answer. There's, as there's aspects to the conversation around, again, understanding if these rules of thumbs apply to you. Can you do more? Can you do less? What does your income look like? Is it variable comp? Are you a salesperson getting compensated through commissions? Or is it a stated salary with a bonus? Like all these factors come in when it comes to a house. But how much you can afford is how much you're willing to put down and how much you're willing on the debt to carry. That's my answer. Do you care about interest rates? Absolutely. Should it be the only factor you should consider when buying a home? 
No. Down payment has plenty to do with it. Area in which you're buying the house, uh, appreciation rate in that area has a lot to do with it. Because again, it is an investment, right? And then the notion of how much of your household income monthly should go to this has a lot to do with those rules of thumb. Refer back to those. 50, 30, 20. 50 being all the living expenses, which mortgages and payments come into that, as well as the 20 to 35% relative to specifically principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. So I think if we answer those questions, today I wanted to really talk about, again, how money gets involved psychologically and, and you know around mortgages. But as I mentioned before, I'm not saying that's right or wrong to pay your house off or not pay your house off. What I am saying is that we have to look generationally. Because again, barely a hundred years ago, our families were inheriting land or, or were not having assets that we had to give. But if we did want to look at something, it came within the family. Now we have banks, we have this ability to go and buy. And so we also don't have these situations where the bank has the right to call the loan back within five years. So we don't have this worry anymore that like we have to pay this off right away because they could call us any day. So. It's important to take a breather, go through that, look backwards to look forwards, as I always say, because the psychology we bring into the notion of having to pay it off. Look, obviously stress-wise and relief-wise, it'd be awesome to pay your house off and not have a payment. I get that. But I always say this to clients, it's not like you can go knock on the door of that house and say, hey, I need grocery monies today. You know, So we have to have a happy marriage between your liquid assets and your illiquid assets. And I'm not saying that in a negative way, but our house and typically tangible assets are illiquid. They're not exactly right away accessible to you. So we have to really build a plan that encompasses a house and a home for your family, but also has a good relationship between the dollars you can spend monthly as well, right? That's the liquid environment. So by the way, that also ultimately will include 401ks, IRAs, 403Bs, and all those liquid assets that become available to you in retirement. Okay, it's time to answer your questions. If you have a question or topic you'd like me to address here on the show, you can leave a comment or question in the comment section, or if it's something you wanna talk more one-on-one -on -one or more personal, just go to the About page on our channel and send us an email. We'll always keep the questions I read here anonymous, so you don't have to worry about your name being shared, but we do love hearing from you, so please share. Today's question um, came around refinancing, which has a lot to do with our house. When is the right time or when is it worth it to refinance. Uh, an example of that could be if the interest rates go down maybe half percent or 1%. I know right now we're in a rising interest rate environment, but when we talk about refinancing, I'll come up with a few things, but I wanna start with this. First and foremost, this to me has always been a question when I advise clients, it's really in the eyes of the beholder. Because if you look at the math, which I'll give you to in a second, it has to do with what you're willing to do to is a certain reduction in payment worth it to you. Anyone who's gone through a mortgage or gone through a refinance before knows it's not the most fun process. It's quite lengthy. They're going to ask for everything under the sun, a lot of documents, this, that, and the other. So it has to do with the process there. But some math I think is important to look at. Let's just talk about some rate decreases, and then we're going to talk about rate increases. When it comes to a rate decrease, using a 5%, right now, typical mortgages, conventional or jumbo, depending on where you're at, is right around 5%. It might go up a little bit here soon. Uh, on a 30-year fix, let's say it's 5%. Every $100,000 of mortgage that goes down by 25 basis points or 0.25% is about $15 a month. If you have a half a million dollar loan, that's right around seven, 75 bucks a month, right? So is it worth it to you is the question. I have the beholder. Is it worth it to you to go through a refinance to reduce uh, your mortgage payment by 75 bucks a month? Now that's on the monthly. You extrapolate that out over 30 years and you keep that same mortgage, that number becomes quite a savings, which many people talk about. And yes, that is factual and true. So I'm all for that. Now to talk about a 1% decrease, which is a much more significant one for that same example at 5% at $100,000, every $100,000 is right around $90, give or take of monthly reduction. So if you have a half a million dollar mortgage, that's around $450 a month of savings. Again, I either behold, that's a lot of money. So is $75 a month. Just depends on your budget, your overhead. Again, going back up to what we talked about today with regards to how much of your monthly income should go towards your mortgage. If that helps lower that, that's likely a good thing. And then over the long haul of the mortgage, if you are going out 15, 20, 25, or 30 years, the amount of savings that you are saving over that time, even by a 25 basis point reduction, adds up. So I think the worth it or when is the right time? 
I think anytime you see a rate reduction, it's probably worth looking at. I think going through with your lender and talking through it or talking with your advisor about your situation to help you find that right lender for you, I think it's worth looking at. I also think it's an interesting time period to do if even in a rising interest rate environment, if you have things on your mortgages from previous items in your life, like PMI or items like that, it's probably worth looking at because if you can at least get the insurance off of there, even though your rate is higher, you can then hopefully refi when it goes lower. Now, that's more of a strategy around whether that's right for you and if you wanna get the deductions by raising your interest rate, but it does add to the amount of the loan at the end. So you have to look at that from different contexts. So it's a great question. It's subjective in the sense that there's not really a right answer other than if you look at math, anytime you get a reduction in rate, it's probably a good time to look at it. Yes, there's a lot of work involved with the refinance, but again, it is worth it because over the life of the loan, you will be saving quite a bit. Now, for those of you who had a 30 year fixed, who are 10 years into it and don't like the notion of adding another 10 years on, even though the rate's lower, that's also math as well. You got to run the differences. So again, it's not the most direct answer because when it comes to mortgage and debt payments, it's a very subjective one. Again, I have the beholder. This is where counsel and an advisor comes in really handy with you to help you walk through the differences there. Uh, it's very easy to do on a mortgage calculator and things like that if you know the numbers and know what you're looking at. So again, if you have a question or comment you'd like me to read here, you can leave it in the comments section or email us in the about page on our channel. But before we go, if you found anything helpful today and want to learn more, you can visit our website at onecapital.com or you can scan the QR code that's on your screen with your smartphone and it'll get you right there. You can also call or text us. We want to help. Listen, there's no pressure here. We don't treat people like a number. In fact, we value our relationships. It's the lifeblood of what we do as private wealth advisors. So click, call, or text us today. If you're not following us on social media, you should be. You can follow us at Make Your Money Matter. We're sharing great information on all of our social media platforms. And as I often say, if you enjoy the show, you like the show, share with someone you like. If you don't like it, I guess, share with someone you don't like. But until next time, always remember, make your money matter.